Hello and welcome. I'm Peter Afrasiabi, host of the Curious Lawyer Program. Today you're on our Bill of Rights segment. It's a great look at the first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution, and today we're on the First Amendment. So sit back, get your cocktail, buckle up, and let's get ready to spend an hour learning all about the First Amendment. Now, before we start, I want to just do a quick stop, pit stop at the Curious Lawyer programs and tell you a little bit more about the programs, their purpose, their background. We look at different areas of the law that are educational and entertaining, areas of the law that you won't see in your practice area on, on your day-to-day -day basis, unless you happen to be a CIA lawyer, for example. Um, we've done a program on the CIA and how it operates, the CIA law. We've done dog law, celebrity and paparazzi law. You can learn copyright by exploring the music of U2. Of course, we have this Bill of Rights series. You can even learn if there is a perfect murder zone in Yellowstone National Park. To answer the question, I'm going to have to make you go watch the program. I'm not going to tell you the answer today. But in any event, these programs are designed to give you a multidisciplinary approach to your legal education so that you can go and learn about a different educational entertaining area of the law, but find metaphors, analogies, intersections, segments that connect with what it is you do on a day-to-day -day basis. For example, dog law will have a bit of a walk through contract, talk tort law, trusts in estate law, you name it, right? So it's a great way of intersecting different areas in a fun educational way that's lower stress perhaps than the CLE you do in your core practice area. With that said, let's get going on the First Amendment and we start, as we always do in the Bill of Rights series, with the amendment itself. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. There's our language on the slide. Let's take a look then today on our next slide here on the issues that we will address today. And today's focus will only be on the free speech clause. The reality of the First Amendment is that in a one hour CLE program on the First Amendment, one can only really address free speech in one hour. There's so much to talk about. And I didn't want to pay short shrift to you on free speech by doing a very, very surface level analysis of speech in order to make room for the religion clauses. So look out for our sidebar programs where you can get a deep dive on the religion clauses of the First Amendment as an adjunct to this Bill of Rights series. It's out there for you, but today you're going to be learning about speech. And so we will look at the historical scope and rationale, the purpose, the goal, how the First Amendment um, free speech clause has functioned historically in litigation. And you can, we will see how the courts, particularly the Supreme Court, has treated it over time since the founding of the Republic. This will allow us to look at the substantive scope and as we look at the Supreme Court's rulings and tests, we will get a little bit of insight into how the, the clause has worked for the court as time has worn on in our republic. So we will see in the 19th century some pornography by mail cases, abolitionist prosecutions. We will see how those intersect with the First Amendment. As we turn into the 20th century, we will see the incitement speech cases. And yet again, we will happen to touch on pornography as we will um, have a little um, wander into the realm of obscenity in the Supreme Court of the United States sitting around watching pornography to figure out if it was lawful speech or obscenity. And then we will look at the 21st century, well into our 2020s now, where we take a look at the most recent Supreme Court rulings on free speech cases and really see where the free speech clause is standing today and how today it's intersecting with today's issues which are different, of course. But one of the fascinating things we will see as we walk through all of these cases is that we are constantly addressing the tension of the current social policy issues animating society that instantly and rapidly, really, faster perhaps than with the other amendments, as we've seen in the Bill of Rights series, hit the litigation realm and find an outlet to figure out if what is going on with us as a people in the social policy realm, how it works and collides with the legal realm. Now we will look at free speech and we will then look at the limits on free speech with, with several categories where the Supreme Court has limited the concept of absolute free speech vis-a-vis um, -vis government regulation. And that will include defamation, threats, fighting words, profanity, obscenity, 
incitement to imminent lawless actions, and we will also look at school standards in here. And we will end by looking at some modern issues about the government's role really in private speech and the current 2020s Supreme Court landscape from commercial websites to school prayers and the intersection actually of school prayers um, or prayers on school property as speech and whether the ability to engage in those prayers where we start intersecting with the religion clauses touches the free speech rights of the people to engage in quiet prayers. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. So let's get going here on our first slide by taking a look um, back in history. And we're going to start by pondering the First Amendment in the 19th century. And so you see here we have the case of State versus Gruber. This is from Maryland in 1819. And this involved um, a Reverend Gruber who was a member of the Methodist Episcopal Church. And he preached a sermon at a camp meeting. And this was organized by his uh, Methodist Episcopal Church. And he preached this sermon to around 5,000 white people who were in attendance and around 400 odd slaves. Now, Reverend Gruber, Gruber criticized slavery as a, quote, national sin, end quote, and said this is contrary to the founding principles of the Republic. In short order, Gruber, Reverend Gruber, that is, was arrested and in a criminal indictment was charged with attempting to stir up acts of mutiny and rebellion. It's a sort of an old form, in essence, of incitement and the incitement speech issues which have, as we see now, touched the country from the beginning and touch us even to this day. Now, what happened in this case, you know, interestingly, is that uh, a lawyer by the name of Taney, who later became an infamous Supreme Court justice, obviously, defended Gruber and secured an actual acquittal um, in front of the jury on free speech basis. So the case never made its way up to the Supreme Court, but um, it's an early example of someone engaging in speech that's deemed insightful, um, likely to cause problems, and also now it's um, abolitionist speech, obviously the massive is issue of the day in terms of slavery and abolition, but was able to secure an acquittal in front of the jury saying that no, he had the right to engage in um, that speech by calling this a national sin and that the prosecution was fundamentally improper because he secured an acquittal. Now actually what's interesting is many southern states thereafter this started actually passing more specific laws banning abolitionist literature and speech and in perhaps great tragic um, irony um, to the situation, this lawyer Taney who represented Gruber and, and secured an acquittal of Gr Gruber, allowing him to engage in this um, abolitionist speech, Taney later when he was on the Supreme Court delivered the Supreme Court's infamous Dred Scott decision in 1857. <clears throat> so as we move along, let's go now to the late 1880s and we're going to look at the case of Murphy v. Ramsey. It's reported at 114 U.S. 15 and this is from 1885. This deals with another big issue, the social policy political issue that was affecting the country at the time, and this is the issue of polygamy um, as states were expanding in, in the West, the question of whether polygamy would be legal federally or not, and how it would be addressed. And so a federal law existed and was passed that denied polygamists the right to vote. Now, the plaintiff, Murphy, and other Mormons in his um, congregation challenged this provision as violating their First Amendment rights. And the case went up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and in a unanimous decision, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the law denying them their right to vote. And it interestingly upheld the law fundamentally on religious grounds, creating this sort of early intersection between free speech concepts and religion, only it's inverted. Here's the quote from the case. The idea of the family is consisting in and springing from the union for life of one man and one woman in the holiest state of matrimony was the sure foundation of all that is stable and noble in our civilization. And quote, the best guarantee of that reverent morality which is the source of all beneficent progress in social and political improvement. And so with that root underlying rationale or foundation, this federal law denying polygamists the right to vote was upheld as not violating their First Amendment right because the law was grounded in appropriate religion and morality that formed the basis of the Republic. So let's keep moving along and looking at other social issues that come to light and cause controversy. Now we're in 1895 and we're going to look at Grimm versus United States. It's reported at 156 U.S. 604. 
And this is one of the early U.S. Supreme Court cases dealing with the First Amendment and pornography in the 1800s. And so here's what we have. We have Grimm, a man who was indicted under an 1888 version of the Comstock Act, um, which was originally passed in 1873. So there were some amendments to it. About 15 years later in the 1880s, he gets indicted. And basically the facts that sat beneath it are that a postal inspector took on an assumed name and wrote to Grimm, literally put a letter in the post box mail stamp and all that, the way we used to do things and don't do them very often that way anymore. In any event, sent this letter off to Grimm, who was a photographer and owner of an art studio. And the letter was designed to ask for access to lewd pictures. Now, Grimm responded by affirming that he had pictures for sale, he could connect um, this um, you know, postal inspector, who he didn't know it was a postal inspector, obviously, to um, others where he could get these lewd pictures, um, these early pornography pictures. Um, so in any event, Grimm is then indicted for sending obscene materials. Um, but it wasn't for the actual act of sending them because he never did, but he was actually indicating that he had and could in his letter send them or find them or identify where to get them. And so it's particularly interesting because he's now being indicted not for actually trafficking per se in obscenity, but for uh, having an ability to do so. But here's what the Supreme Court held. However innocent on its face it may, be, it may appear, if it conveyed and was intended to convey information in respect to the place or person where or of whom such objectionable matters could be obtained, it is within the statute. It may well be that the sender of such a letter has no single picture or other obscene publication or print in his mind, but simply knowing where matter of an obscene character can be obtained, uses the mails to give such information to others. Just pause there before I continue. It's a staggering concept when you think that the Supreme Court is now expressly recognizing that the person may not even possess them or have them, but may simply have knowledge in his brain of where something obscene may exist. And that alone makes it okay to be indicted and prosecuted for one's thoughts, apparently. Let's continue. It is unnecessary that unlawful intent as to any particular picture be charged or proved. It is enough that in a certain place there could be obtained pictures of that character, either already made and for sale or distribution, or from someone willing to make them, and that the defendant, aware of this, used the mails to convey to others the like knowledge. In this entire analysis, notwithstanding the massive First Amendment issues at stake, the Supreme Court simply ignored the First Amendment, affirmed this conviction of Grimm, and that was 1895. So now let's go to the early 20th century as we roll into the next century, and we're going to look at the many cases, which obviously you're familiar with from, from law school, that deal with the other massive area of speech that constantly um, you know, hits tension with the First Amendment, and that's um, incitement, um, language that people believe is disloyal or scurrilous or tending to undermine the democracy. And this, we're going to look now at the case of Debs versus United States, 249 U.S. 211, and this is in 1919. And it'll allow us to look at a few of these cases that all came up at the exact same time, basically, to the U.S. Supreme Court dealing with what is fundamentally incitement speech for, for um, categorical definitional purposes for us. So Debs was obviously a very well-known public figure. He had received almost a million votes when he ran for president in 1912 on the socialist ticket. And then in 1918, Debs gives a speech outside the Canton, Ohio prison. Um, and he'd been there visiting three socialists who were convicted of violating the, the Sedition Act and they'd been imprisoned. Now the Sedition Act at issue here provides, quote, or provided at the time, quote, any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the form of government of the United States or the flag of the United States or the uniform of the Army or Navy, end quote, could be prosecuted. So Debs goes out, he speaks to 1,200 people outside this prison. He offers his support for the prisoners, saying they're paying the price for seeking to pave the way for better conditions for all mankind. Um, he's a pacifist, he condemned the war, but he actually took care not to advocate any illegal activity and even commented to his audience that he had to be prudent with his word choice. Nonetheless, he was arrested and convicted, he got a 10-year sentence, and he takes this up on appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, arguing that it violated his First Amendment speech rights. And so let's look on the next slide.
at what had come down in the exact same term, and that's the well-known case of Schenck. And Schenck is a case, of course, that decided and adopted the clear and present danger test for speech, looking at words in context. And as applied to Debs, a unanimous Supreme Court, as written by Justice Holmes, held that even though Debs did not expressly advocate draft resistance, his intent and the general tendency of his words were, th were together sufficient for a jury to convict him fairly. And in fact, in perhaps tragic irony here too, um, the Supreme Court even noted that, you know, he, he had noted in his speech that he had to be careful what he said, and that showed an awareness that he was kind of in the, the, zone, the, the zone of um, incitement, as opposed to seeing it as a sign of him actually being careful. Now, the same term, we had Abrams v. U.S., and this is about eight months later on, where you have a similar case of several individuals who are convicted of distributing leaflets advocating their political views about the Russian Revolution. They were convicted um, as offering clear and present danger. Um, they were, the conviction was affirmed by the Supreme Court, but this time Holmes issued actually an impassioned dissent. Um, and in dissent he said, those who think they are right will find it perfectly logical to translate their convictions into the law and impose them on others, but it is the theory of our Constitution that the best test of truth is a free trade in ideas. So interestingly, he himself dissenting there saying that didn't have the same feelings towards um, Eugene Debs several months earlier. But nonetheless, after three years in prison, Eugene Debs' sentence was commuted, um, but it enabled President Harding to be elected, so Debs wasn't around to interfere with the election. Let's take a little quick sidestep here and talk um, about whether the First Amendment applies to the states, and this is the incorporation doctrine issue. And so the fundamental issue is um, that we have this idea that the protections of the constitutional amendments um, in the Bill of Rights had only applied to the federal government at the founding of the republic, and they did not apply to the state governments. And so the question then was raised after the Civil War Amendments were adopted as to whether the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause um, fundamentally incorporated those 10 amendments by reference and made them basically applicable to state governments. And this sort of question of whether we had this massive new reordering in our constitutional world after the Civil um, War Amendments um, is answered by this basic test that the Supreme Court's adopted, and that is they look to figure out whether the rights at issue in the Bill of Rights are fundamental ones rooted in the tradition and conscience of our people and therefore implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. And if they are, they get incorporated and applied to the states via the 14th Amendment. And that's sort of one of many cases that looks at this test, but the Griswold v. Connecticut case um, dealing with contraception in the 1960s is, an, is one that sort of looks at it, and it's a good case to go look at if you want to get a better sense of the incorporation doctrine. And really, all of the Bill of Rights, except a, except a few portions of some of them, have been, a, have been incorporated and adopted. Now, the First Amendment has been. Um, one of the cases is another one of these um, um, cases dealing with left-wing manifestos being prosecuted, and that was Gitlow v. New York in 268 U.S. 652, and there you had state prosecution um, for a left-wing manifesto publication and conviction. And it was incorporated and applied to the states, and Gitlow's um, conviction was upheld. Let's go into modern standards now and, and look at some of the basic rules and operating principles that we, that we now confront in our modern First Amendment world. And so the court will scrutinize closely any sort of content-based or viewpoint-based speech restrictions. That's city, state, local, federal, um, state government laws. Content-based restrictions. Let's take a look at those first. These are restrictions on speech that are due to the content of the speech. And so an example you could think of is a law that restricts any type of political message from being expressed in a public space. That would be an example of a restriction on speech built around the content of the speech, i.e. political messages. Another one is viewpoint-based restrictions. And these are restrictions on speech that are due to the viewpoint expressed by the speaker. And so an example of this could be a law that restricts someone from expressing a particular um, political viewpoint, such as support for Donald Trump or support for um, Barack Obama. That would be an example of a viewpoint-based restriction. And then the Supreme Court looks at content-neutral laws. And these are laws that restrict speech in a content-neutral manner. And they're generally analyzed then under intermediate scrutiny in that they need to serve or advance some sort of important government purpose and there must be some substantially related um, approach to that purpose in the regulation of the law. So let's take a look now at an example of a content-based example. And this is Reed versus Gilbert from U.S. Supreme Court in 2005. 
It's at 576 US 155. And this case comes out of Arizona. And what we have in 2005 is the city of Gilbert, Arizona adopts a municipal ordinance that regulates the manner in which signs can be displayed in public areas. And the ordinance imposed stricter limitations on signs that were advertising religious services than signs that displayed political or ideological messages, for example. Now, a local church would post a whole bunch of signs on Sunday about the services and the church, and they were then ultimately cited for violating the ordinance. The case worked its way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the court held that the town's sign ordinance imposed content-based restrictions that did not survive strict scrutiny because the ordin ordinance was not narrowly tailored to further a compelling government interest. And Justice Thomas wrote a unanimous opinion here and clarified that strict scrutiny always applies when a law is content-based on its face. And so this is a good example of content-based laws um, being subjected to strict scrutiny and just being struck down as being unconstitutional under the First Amendment. Now let's take a look at a recent viewpoint-based example, and this is the case of Mattal versus Tam. It's um, Supreme Court case number is 15-293, and this is from 2017. And this is an intellectual property case that intersects with the First Amendment and makes its way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the basic facts are as follows. You have an Asian American rock band, a music band, and they wanted to register their name um, with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, the PTO. And the name of their band was The Slants. And this was an act they, and they chose to register their name and they appropriated and no, reappropriated this name in this act of reappropriating a historical slur. And the goal was this idea that the concept behind it is that by adopting this terrible historical slur, they would drain it of any historical negativity and just make it the trademark for their band and this sort of in this reappropriation of these old slurs. And so in any event, they, and there's a picture of the band up there, they went to the PTO, the Patent and Trademark Office, and said, we want to get a trademark. That's the name of our band. We're, we're, act, we're, doing, we're making music, selling t-shirts, CDs, uh, music, whatnot, in commerce. We want to register the name to get you know, protection under the Lanham Act of our trademark. But under 15 U.S.C. 1052, there's a, there's a federal provision that says trademarks wouldn't be issued on disparaging um, marks. And so their trademark application was denied. And they took this appeal then up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court held that denying trademarks that are disparaging is an example of a viewpoint restriction that fails for the First Amendment standards. And basically, you cannot reject a mark because of the viewpoint it espouses. And so here's the quote from the case at page 22 to 23 of the opinion. Our cases use the term viewpoint discrimination in a broad sense. And in that sense, the disparagement clause discriminates on the basis of viewpoint. To be sure, the clause even-handedly prohibits disparagement of all groups. It applies equally to marks that damn Democrats and Republicans, capitalists and socialists, and those arrayed on both sides of every possible at issue. It denies registration to any mark that is offensive to a substantial percentage of the members of any group. But in the sense relevant here, that is viewpoint discrimination. Giving offense is a viewpoint. We have said time and again that the public expression of ideas may not be prohibited merely because the ideas are themselves offensive to some of their hearers. And so that's an example of viewpoint discrimination and the trademark regulations being struck down so the band was able to have their mark issued, um, their registered trademark issued by the government. So let's take a look then at categories of speech that don't fare as well and are either unprotected or less protected and are then subject to government regulation or limitations, notwithstanding the First Amendment. And so we will walk through now incitement to violence cases, threats and fighting words, obscenity. We're even going to look at whether lying is protected by the First Amendment, defamation. And we're going to look at um, some of this in the context of school speech st standards and how, how these issues fare in schools. Let's start with the modern test for incitement, since walking through our history, we sort of um, traced this thread through history of incitement speech. And so the modern test comes from Brandenburg versus Ohio, 395 U.S. 444 in 1969. And here you have um, Brandenburg is speaking to a bunch of KKK members in Ohio, and the speech was um, recorded by some media representatives who had been invited. And Brandenburg discusses the fate of the, quote, white Caucasian race, end quote, and he talks about it at the hands of the government. He made a bunch of anti-Semitic and anti-black statements, and he alluded to the possibility of revengeance, 
which was, I think he was trying to say either revenge or vengeance, um, you know, but in any event, if the federal government and the court um, continue to, quote, suppress the white Caucasian race, end quote. He also announced that Klan members were planning to march on Washington, D.C. on Independence Day. And so he was then arrested and convicted of advocating criminal activity or unlawful methods of terrorism and political reform. And so the case went up, and this led to a unanimous reversal of his conviction and an abandonment of that clear and present danger test that came from Abrams, Schenck, Debs, and those cases. And the court now used a two-pronged test to evaluate speech acts as to whether they could be regulated as um, um, triggering you know, an incitement. Speech can be prohibited if it is directed at inciting or producing imminent lawless action, and it is likely to incite or produce such, such action. And so now we're looking at this sort of, this imminent lawless um, test coupled with the concept that it will in fact likely do so imminently. That's the modern test for incitement. It falls within that, it can be regulated. If not, it cannot. Now let's take a quick look at how this test has fared you know, now into the 21st century. And you can look at a recent case, and this is um, known as the Trump rally case. And here's the basic facts. Um, there were several anti-President um, Trump protesters at a 2016 rally. They, got, they ended up being roughed up at the rally. Um, at, the, at that time, candidate Trump, I guess, had urged the crowd to get him out of here because they were you know, making noise or whatnot at one of his campaign rallies. Um, and so they turned around and sued Trump for inciting a riot and, and the injury and whatnot to them. And this went before a district judge, District Judge Hale, and he found a plausible claim that candidate Trump had incited a riot. And so he rejected President Trump or Trump's um, First Amendment free speech claims. This went up to the Sixth Circuit, and the Sixth Circuit reversed, relying on Brandenburg and basically indicated that Trump did not specifically advocate imminent lawless action. Here's the quote. The words were said at a campaign rally by the main speaker in response to disturbances caused by protesters. The words were directed, um, the words were self-evident said in order to quell the disturbances by removing the protesters. They were directed to unidentified listeners in the convention center, among whom most were Trump supporters who were not sympathetic with the protesters. In the ears of some supporters, Trump's words may have had a tendency to elicit a physical response in the event a disruptive protester refused to leave, but they did not specifically advocate such a response. And so there you see this, this nexus requirement for imminent lawless action and specifically advocating and pushing for it as opposed to generalized statements. Let's take a look now as we move along to threats and free speech limits based on threats. Well, true threats are words or expressive conduct that indicate to the recipient of the words or expression that the speaker is about to engage in some form of violent act. And those the government can prevent because of the conduct associated with it. You don't have a First Amendment right to get in someone's face and tell them, I'm going to you know, kick your butt um, or worse. Um, now, we can look at actually very, very recent Supreme Court case, June of 2023 that may have started imposing even some limits here on how the government goes about um, prosecuting and regulating threat cases. And this is the case of Counterman versus Colorado, um, case number 22-138 on the Supreme Court's docket. And here you have a man who was convicted for stalking and threats after saying the following types of things. Was that you in the white Jeep? Seems like I'm being talked about more than I'm being talked to. This isn't healthy. You're not being good for human relations. Die, don't need you. Um, and this sort of stalking harassment campaign went on for a while, gets arrested. And so the issue that goes up to the Supreme Court is whether the speaker needed to know that the words were threatening or if it's enough really that a reasonable person would interpret those words as threatening. And here's what the Supreme Court held. The state must prove in these true threat cases that the defendant had some subjective understanding of his statement's threatening nature. But the First Amendment requires no more demanding a showing than recklessness. In this context, a recklessness standard would be as follows, i.e., a showing that a person consciously disregarded a substantial and unjustifiable risk that his conduct will cause harm to another. And so that's a little tighter standard than existed before and requires this look into um, a subjective understanding um, you know, even if it's only recklessness, it still needs to be shown at that level as opposed to simply how would some objective third party reasonable per person interpret them type test, which didn't look at the subjective understanding of the person uttering the threats. So this is seen basically as 
perhaps narrowing, narrowing the scope of what constitutes a true threat, um, thereby breathing broader life perhaps into the First Amendment here and limiting this um, category of threat speech slightly, but still limiting it a bit more than it had been before. Now let's take a look at fighting words and how fighting words collide with the First Amendment and speech limits on them. And so we can start on the fighting words page by looking at the famous case from 1942 of Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire. And this is reported at 315 U.S. 568. And the basic facts are that Chaplinsky called a police officer a damned fascist and a racketeer. He then gets arrested, indicted, and convicted by the state of New Hampshire for violating a New Hampshire law that prohibited speech directed at a person on public streets where the speech derides, offends, or annoys others. Now, the court ultimately upheld the conviction because the words constituted fighting words and the government has an interest in promoting peace, the court said. Now, you look at that and say, yikes, that's, some pretty, that's a pretty aggressive prosecution, pretty um, you know, broad set of um, use of this and that collides with the First Amendment, you may feel today. Um, and the truth is that Chaplinsky has never been specifically overruled since then, but it's effectively been narrowed almost to the point of non-existence. So, you know, an identical case today, you call a cop on a public street a damned fascist. Um, you know, you get indicted under some similar statute, Chaplinsky probably would fall expressly today. But nonetheless, states still are able to ban the use of fighting words if they are personally abusive epithets that are inherently likely to incite immediate physical retaliation. So again, it's somewhat similar to what we looked at in the incitement cases in that, you know, these types of fighting words can be prohibited when they're looking to provoke and trigger an immediate physical retaliation. Um, so if you've got some sort of situation um, where the words constitute a face-to-face -face direct invitation to engage in fisticuffs with the speaker, that's kind of the quote, basically, then the Supreme Court will probably uphold a conviction. But if it's not really like that, um, going to fall and fighting words will be allowed to be uttered. Now let's take a look at obscenity and the long um, history of obscenity and speech limits and how obscenity has sort of factored into our First Amendment jurisprudence and the sort of connection, of course, between obscenity and pornography. Now, obscenity is an unprotected category of speech. The question, of course, is what's obscene, right? Is that pornography magazine obscene or is it not? And this has been a long, difficult um, process for the Supreme Court as it's batted around um, the issues. And we can really start as well. I suppose we started even earlier, as you saw in the beginning of this program, with the mail by um, the mailing of lewd pictures, which I guess at the time were deemed obscene if it was some um, nude photograph of someone. Um, but now we're in the 20th century and we'll look at Jacob Ellis versus Ohio. And this is a case in 1964 at 378 US 184. And this is a case where the manager of a, a pornography kind of, um, you know, movie theater was convicted of exhibiting obscenity um, for showing the porn films. Now, this was reversed because the nature of the film was simply not obscene given contemporary standards. And this test of you know, contemporary community standards um, is in essence what was known at the time as the I know it when I see it formulation. And that I know it when I see it as being the test to figure out whether something's obscene or non-obscene and just you know, appropriate pornography. Um, came really from a Justice Stewart concurrence in that case, and here is his quote, I shall not attempt today further to define the kinds of material I understand to be embraced within that shorthand description, and perhaps I could never succeed in intelligibly doing so. But I know it when I see it, and the motion picture involved in this case is not that. Now this, of course, um, famously and perhaps even hilariously, as we'll look at momentarily here, led to the Supreme Court of the United States routinely watching pornography films as they took up all these cases to try to figure out whether a conviction for a given pornography film could be affirmed or should be reversed to figure out whether it's obscene. Um, you know, in light of their conclusion that you know it when you see it, it sort of opened the door to having to take a look at a lot of stuff to figure out what it is. 
And so let's just take a little um, fun sidewalk down through history here as we look at obscenity in the Supreme Court. And this comes from The Brethren, a fantastic book by Bob Woodward. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend reading it. Um, it's you know, a brilliant look at this, uh, so inside look really at the Supreme Court with an unbelievable amount of detail um, of the kind of Warren Court and then the transition to the Burger Court. Um, filled with fascinating stuff in terms of the court from the 1960s and 70s and also just some unbelievably, you know, funny, hilarious sort of um, looks into how these human beings just would operate dealing with the stuff they were dealing with at the time. So okay, that's my plug for Bob Woodward's book. Not that Bob Woodward needs a plug from me. Um, but in any event, what we have in the book is, um, you know, Woodward details the Supreme Court's movie day um, event, as it was called, and various justice um, justices of the Supreme Court had different tests that they would apply when they'd sit around and all get together to watch pornography to figure out whether they're obscene. And so we have some quotes here that come from the book um, in terms of how when they would show up on movie day, pull up their chairs and the projector would start rolling, how the different justices would decide whether something was um, obscene or not. And so apparently, and of course these are quotes from Woodward's books from his journalism, but this was a Justice White test. Quote, there can be no erect penises, no intercourse, no oral or anal sodomy. For white, no erections and no insertions equaled no obscenity. Justice Brennan had a slightly different test. Quote, no erections. He was willing to accept penetration as long as the pictures passed what his clerks referred to as the limp D, I-C-K, you know, standard. Oral sex was tolerable if there was no erection. Justice Stewart, of course, the I know it when I see it guy, adopted what was known as the Casablanca test. And um, the quote is, I know it when I see it. And this came because apparently in Casablanca, as a Navy lieutenant in World War II and a watch officer for his ship, Justice Stewart had seen men bringing back locally um, Casablanca produced pornography. And so based on those experiences, seeing all that pornography coming back from you know, Casablanca, he knew the difference between the hardest of hardcore um, and much of what came to the court. And so he called it his Casablanca test. The rest of us know it as the I know it when I see it test. And so if we go to the next slide here, um, I've got a um, picture from page 198 of the Brethren book. And it's just worth taking a quick pause and reading it here because it really is absolutely hilarious. But basically, um, as you can see at Trader Vic's, Justice Marshall had launched into another story when he suddenly stopped. He stared at his watch a moment. It was about 1.50. My God, I almost forgot, he said in a stricken tone. It's movie day. We have to get back. Movie day was a humorous high point of most terms. Year after year, several of the justices and most of the clerks went either into a basement storeroom or one of the larger conference rooms to watch feature films or exhibits in obscenity cases. And so it goes on, and the absolute hilarious one probably is that Justice Berger refused to attend. He just thought it was just all inappropriate. Um, but what, rather, what, he, what Woodward notes, which is sort of the fundamental issue here, is that we have the Supreme Court acting as a supreme board of censors. Um, now, the others would sit on folding chairs with their clerks, watching such films as I Am Curious projected onto a white wall. And, the, and probably the most hilarious part, if you ask me, is that during his later years, Justice Harlan watched the films from the first row a few feet from the screen. He was only able to make out the general outlines. He was basically blind at the time, apparently. His clerk or another justice would then describe the action. By Jove, Harlan would explain, exclaim, extraordinary. So in any event, that's a hilarious look at sort of how the Supreme Court was managing obscenity in the 1960s and 70s. This is not how it's managed anymore. They had to move away from the I know it when I see it test and get away from movie day. So let's look at obscenity today um, and this line between obscenity and pornography. And, um, Miller versus California, 413 U.S. 15, 1973, essentially is the case that sort of shifted the court from the, um, the need to have their movie day. Um, and so here we have Miller being convicted um, of a mass mailing campaign to sell obscene materials. And basically, California said that um, it was not okay for him to be mass mailing this obscenity that he was mailing and selling um, through the mails. And they convicted him for knowingly distributing obscene material. <laughs> And here, the, the Miller court held that the material he was mailing did meet the definition of obscenity. And the court defines obscenity as material that appeals to the prurient interest that depicts sexual conduct in a patently offensive manner and lacks any serious artistic, literary, political, or scientific value. And so his conviction was, was affirmed. 
Now, pornography in general is not obscene, and it is protected under the First Amendment. So it's the type of stuff that, that goes beyond sort of pornography that falls into obscenity. And, and, and it's probably worth double-clicking on that, as you see we've done here for you. Number one, it appeals to the prurient interest. Number two, it depicts or describes sexual activity in a patently offensive way. And number three, it's lacking any legitimate artistic, political, literary, scientific, um, you know, value whatsoever. And the third one is particularly important because we look at that by um, determining it using a reasonable person standard um, for the community. But elements one and two are um, also defined using community standards of morality and decency. And that's basically the current state of the law. Now, a couple important side notes here are that when we're talking about stuff that is legitimately understood to be obscenity, pr mere private possession of it actually cannot be criminalized. And that's Stanley versus Georgia um, from the U.S. Supreme Court, 394 U.S. 557, 1969. And here's the quote from the case. We hold that the First and Fourteenth Amendments prohibit making mere private possession of obscene material a crime. Now, there are limits to that, of course, and that involves child pornography. And so if we take Osborne versus Ohio from the Supreme Court, reported at 405 U.S. 103 in 1990, the Supreme Court made clear that the Stanley rule of private possession of obscenity did not apply to child pornography. Child, child pornography cannot be um, exempted from the private possession um, um, exemption to obscenity um, being unlawful. So. Um, child porn, absolutely um, off the line for First Amendment, even possession. Let's shift now from sort of obscenity to perhaps the other side of the obscenity coin, or if the coin isn't the right metaphor, somewhere near it on, on a spectrum of, you know, kind of broadly speaking, you know, nasty speech, I guess, for lack of a better phrase. And that would be profanity, and we'll look at Cohen versus California. Cohen versus California is at 403 U.S. 15 in 1971. And here we have Cohen, who was convicted under a California statute. And this California statute um, forbid, quote, maliciously and willfully disturbing the peace or quiet of any neighborhood or person by offensive conduct. Now, Cohen was prosecuted under this statute because he wore a, dra wore a jacket, sorry, to court. And the jacket um, that he wore to court on it said, Fuck the draft, and that's a quote. Um, excuse my profanity, but that those that is the quote that was on the draft. Um, or I say, excuse my profanity, it begs a question: Is it profane? Um, but in any event, he wears that to court. Judge not happy, as you could imagine. Um, now Cohen didn't say anything to anyone, um, and there was no evidence even that the jacket provoked some sort of violent reaction or was inciting imminent kind of types of things that could otherwise lead to it being regulated. And so the question was really whether the state could punish Cohen for this message that he conveyed, even if it was profane. Um, and again, profane, perhaps on the public street, it wouldn't be deemed profane, but maybe in court, different standards may apply. Maybe there's profane, that type of question. But either way, can it be regulated? And so here's what the Supreme Court held. The conviction is both a content and viewpoint-based restriction on Cohen's speech. The message conveyed does not fit into any of the recognized exceptions to the First Amendment. Thus, his conviction must be overturned. The constitutional right of freedom of expression is very broad and powerful and is designed to remove governmental restraints from public discussion. Due to the extreme constitutional importance of this freedom, states may be required to tolerate speech that some citizens find offensive. There is no compelling reason for California to criminalize this particular word as opposed to any other potentially offensive words. Cohen, of course, is very, very significant case in our First Amendment jurisprudence in terms of indicating that this kind of content viewpoint-based restriction, even on profanity, can't stand, and the First Amendment can't stop the utterances of profanities. But of course, as with all Supreme Court cases, there are exceptions. And so let's take a quick look at some of the limits of the reach of Cohen. And this would involve um, the airwaves. And so we have the case of FCC versus Pacifica, um, reported at 438 U.S. 726 in 1978. And this basically upheld the FCC's regulations um, that, and those regulations that had forbid
um, the broadcast of indecent speech from being aired on public radio waves during hours where children were likely to be listening. And so basically it was a um, time, place, manner type restriction on indecent speech, you know, profane speech, right? Could be legitimate and it was okay for the government to restrict profanity um, during hours where children would be listening because, you know, children and profanity is a slightly different issue to Cohen's F the draft um, jacket in a court. And so there are some limits such as that, which is why for those of you who watch daytime soap operas, you don't see a bunch of profanity in them. Now let's talk briefly about lies. Um, and the, you know, lies as it relates to the First Amendment, whether we have a right to lie um, as First Amendment speech. And so let's take a look at the Federal Stolen Valor Act. And here's what the act says. Whoever falsely represents himself or herself, verbally or in writing, to have been awarded in a decoration or medal, where it's not true, shall be fined or imprisoned. And so this Valor Act came to fruition in a piece of litigation um, entitled United States versus Alvarez, 567 U.S. 1209 in 2012. Basically, Mr. Alvarez was a member of a water district board in Claremont, California. And at his first public meeting as a member of the, the water district board, he introduced, introduced himself by saying, I'm a retired Marine of 25 years. I retired back, you know, in the year 2001. Back in 1987, I was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. I got wounded many times by the same guy, end quote. That's his statement. It was all a lie. <laughs> None of it was true. Um, wasn't wounded, no Congressional Medal of Honor, no Purple Heart, wasn't in the Marines, didn't retire. It's outright lie, 100% lie. So he's indicted by the U.S. government for violating the federal Stolen Valor Act. He stole the valor of um, legitimate service members. He pled guilty because he violated it but he reserved an appeal to challenge the constitutionality of the law. And so that took his case up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court issued a series of opinions that are really the very important opinions to parse in terms of understanding lies in the First Amendment. Um, and Justice Kennedy begins the plurality opinion by saying lying was his habit. I mean, this man was a serial liar. So let's take a look at the next slide at the argument and holding. And we're going to look at Justice Kennedy's plurality opinion. The core of the government's argument was that false speech adds little of value to society and thus is generally without First Amendment protection. In other words, lying has no value and so the First Amendment should be able to regulate it. You shouldn't be able to sort of, the speech isn't as important. Um, in its brief, the government argued that false statements have no First Amendment value in themselves and so therefore only protectable to the extent needed to avoid chilling fully protected speech. So that's the argument the government tees up to really put lies into a category of unprotected speech. Now, six justices outright rejected this claim and declared the Stolen Valor Act unconstitutional. But there was no majority opinion because the rationales were differing. And so the plurality of four was um, written by Justice Kennedy um, as he was joined by Chief Justice Roberts um, and Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor. And so the plurality opinion um, rejected the government's claim that lies are generally without First Amendment protection. And so Justice Kennedy acknowledged the prior decisions discussing defamation and fraud um, had allowed punishment of false speech in essence. Defamation is false speech and it can be um, constitutionally limited and prescribed. You can't just engage in defamation or fraudulent um, speech. But he also made clear that the court has never endorsed a categorical rule that the government was advancing here, that false deeds statements receive no First Amendment protection. And here's what's critical. The plurality here expressly rejected the notion that false speech should be in a general category, presumptively unprotected. He said to allow the government to punish false speech would have a chilling effect on expression. And so there was no basis to simply hold them, that Mr. Alvarez could be prosecuted simply for uttering falsehoods. And again, we're not in the context of defamation or committing a fraud against someone like that. And so this is an emphatic decision, ultimately, as you see on our last slide about the case here. Um, you know, and it's really emphatic between the plurality opinion and the concurrence um, that there is a right to engage in general in false speech and that that is protected by the First Amendment. And the limits, of course, involve perjury, defamation, false advertising, you can't like fraudulently, you know, misrepresent things to people and 
claim a right to sort of <laughs> avoid the fraud on um, civil litigation on the First Amendment. But outside of those contexts that are actually imposing those types of harms, the act of engaging in false speech is fully protected by um, the First Amendment. And so criminalizing the act of lying itself is not okay. And that's the core aspect to lying in the First Amendment. Now let's quickly move to defamation liability in the First Amendment as we started touching it in our prior segment on lies. And this brings us, of course, to New York Times v. Sullivan. And the rule here is that the court has varying levels of protection for speech against people depending upon the type of speech and the category of um, person the speech is directed towards. And critically, public officials and public figures or matters of public concern, that type of speech, in order for someone to be found liable under state law for defamation for such speech, um, you know, and have a state judgment of liability attached, that's, that legitimacy collides with the First Amendment unless there's actual malice. And so the Supreme Court in Sullivan adopts this actual malice standard for defamation that says the First Amendment's okay with defamation liability on public officials, public figures, public concern, only if there's actual malice. And so that exists if the state speaker makes the statement with actual knowledge of its falsity or was reckless in regard of the truth. Now, of course, the plaintiff's got to be a public official or someone running for office. Um, there's, it's got to be proven by clear and convincing evidence. The plaintiff's got to prove the falsity of the statement and actual malice. The defendant knew the statement was false. And so it's a very, very high bar that makes public officials, public fitter, figures, um, matters of public concern type defamation, libel, slander type cases very, very hard to prove because it's a hard hurdle to get over. Um, Sullivan himself had sued the New York Times for libel um, when it wrote that he had mistreated protesters and Dr. King at a protest um, where he was like the local officer in charge. And he prevailed and got a judgment, but this was reversed under this actual malice standard because there was simply no showing that the New York Times, when it wrote that he you know, mistreated Dr. Martin Luther King or the protesters, and did it with actual malice. And so this, of course, has expanded to other torts too, the famous case of Falwell versus Hustler in 1988 where they had their parody advertisement that suggested that Pastor Falwell was involved in some devious sexual shenanigans with his mother in an outhouse. He didn't find it funny when that was put in the Hustler magazine. He sued for intentional infliction of emotional distress and he lost under the actual malice standard. Now in the 21st century, I bring this up, this important case up because Justice Thomas has dissented regularly that Sullivan's simply unconstitutional. His basic argument is it's made up. Um, it's just made up and it needs to be revisited. And he's been pushing this even more heavily in recent years in the 2020s. And so the consensus seems to be that we may see Sullivan revisited at some point, especially as we now are in the internet age um, where we have speech online colliding with um, Section 230 of the Telecommunications Decency Act, um, trying to figure out liability standards for speakers or republishers, these online, you know, you know Twitter, Facebook, whatever, in terms of what, what's being published there. So we may see New York Times v. Sullivan get revisited in coming years. Stay tuned. Students and speech, on our next slide, we're gonna go from the Vietnam War to bong hits for Jesus. And so let's start with Tinker. This is 1969, students wore black armbands to protest um, the US's involvement in the Vietnam War. They get sent home, and then the issue before the Supreme Court is can it be punished for that political speech based only on its content, where it didn't create a disruption? And the holding was that, and this is the important holding for schools, students don't shed their constitutional right to freedom of speech at the schoolhouse gate. And so the First Amendment did apply. Now there are some limits. It's not unfettered speech rights. The court's always going to balance the pedagogical interests of the school with the speech and its ability to create a substantial disruption to the educational environment. And if you cross that line, then this, there's going to be some ability to regulate it. Let's go from Vietnam War armbands to bong hits for Jesus. And that's 2007 case at the Supreme Court of Morse v. Frederick. The banner at school the student brought said bong hits for Jesus. He gets suspended because it was perceived as promoting illegal drug use. And so now the question again was whether in light of Tinker, the First Amendment could allow school, the school to punish the student for displaying that message um, that ostensibly promoted illegal drug use um, at school events. And here the US Supreme Court held that the First Amendment rights of students, they're not automatically coextensive with adults. There's special characteristics of the school environment, and so the school acted reasonably when, inter when interpreting it as a message promoting illegal drug use. So bong hits for Jesus can be regulated under the First Amendment, um, but black armbands cannot. 
Now let's go to the 2020s. We'll end today with a couple of very, very recent cases from, from the Supreme Court. We'll look first at 303 Creative versus Ellis. This is June of 2023. It came down, case number 21-476. And here we have Colorado's public accommodations law that prohibited businesses open to the public from discriminating against people on public grounds. Kind of a standard state public accommodations law. Now the plaintiff was a web designer who challenged the law because she objected to being required to make websites for same-sex marriages. In other words, you know, she's got a business that's open. This Colorado law says you can't discriminate against people on the basis of sexual orientation. But if people come to her, um, same-sex couples come to her and they want her to make wedding websites, she didn't want to have to make them. And she felt this law was unconstitutional. Now, what's particularly important for this case, perhaps in terms of the shadow it casts and um, how extreme it will be or not be um, in coming years is that this was a case built on stipulated facts. And the stipulated fact was that the actual website creation business was core expressive First Amendment um, um, behavior. Um, and that may or may not have been a fact that would be ultimately found if disputed, but nonetheless the state dis um, stipulated to it. And so what the court held is that the First Amendment prohibited Colorado from compelling her to design a website conveying a message he did not endorse. The core of the First Amendment is freedom of thought, speech, and the government cannot compel speech or thought. Here's the quote. Speech conveyed over the internet, like all manner of speech, qualifies for the First Amendment. The court agrees with the Tenth Circuit that the wedding website she seeks to create involve her speech, a conclusion supported by the party's stipulations, including that Ms. Smith intends to produce a final story for each couple using her own words and original artwork. The dissent was vehement. Um, in this case, and it said, today the court for the first time in history grants a business open to the public a constitutional right to refuse to serve members of a protected class. As I will explain, the law in question targets conduct, not speech for regulation, and the act of discrimination has never constituted protected expression under the First Amendment. So you see this is a very significant case that's come down in 2023 on this line of free speech on the internet and how it collides with um, general public accommodation, anti-discrimination laws that have now been curtailed in the name of the First Amendment. A similar case, getting at this sort of collision between First Amendment, anti-discrimination principles, and now touching religion a little bit, um, coming from the 2020s also is Kennedy versus Bremerton, um, 2022. And here we have a coach being fired when he knelt at midfield after the games to do a private um, quiet prayer. And here the court held that the free exercise and free speech clauses of the First Amendment protected his right to engage in personal religious observance from government reprisal. Um, and the, you know, as applied, here's the quote, when Mr. Kennedy uttered these, pr these three prayers that resulted in a suspension, he wasn't engaged in speech ordinarily within the scope of his duties. He didn't speak pursuant to a government policy and wasn't trying to convey a government message. He's not instructing players or discuss discussing strategy or anything like that. His, his prayer simply did not owe any existence to his responsibilities as a public employee. And so he is therefore entitled to engage in those prayers as a matter of free speech. And the case was both free speech and free exercise. Check out our programs on the First Amendment free exercise, free um, um, establishment clause um, laws later. But what's fundamental here is it was also a free speech case. And so the quote, as you see in our last bullet point here, is that the Constitution neither mandates nor tolerates that kind of discrimination. Mr. Kennedy, Kennedy is entitled to summary judgment on his religious exercise and free speech claims. Respect for religious expression is indispensable to life in a free and diverse republic. And a government entity that seeks to punish an individual for engaging in personal religious observance based on a mistaken view that it has a duty to suppress religious observances, even as it allows comparable secular speech, is where the line is. And so those are the two of the most recent Supreme Court's free speech cases. This brings us today to our conclusions on our Curious Lawyer Bill of Rights series First Amendment program. What's particularly interesting, I think, if you step back and think about the last hour and everything we looked at is that it's constantly the very, very significant, cutting edge, pressing social issues of a day that are animating society you know, in the social, political, economic realm. They quickly translate into First Amendment test cases to sort of get at um, what we as a people are going to allow in free speech. And they find their way into the courts almost instantly. The big issues of the day in the 19th century were polygamy and abolitionist speech. Obviously, that was what mattered then. Found its way quickly into the First Amendment realm. 
In the early 20th century, we saw, you know, given everything that was going on domestically and, and you know, the Soviet the Russia and the Russian Revolution, World War I, World War II, this sort of revolutionary speech, anti-American speech, that type of stuff um, is what quickly found its way into legislation being adopted and then First Amendment um, um, convictions and First Amendment challenges. And then as we moved um, later into the 20th century, we get to really, um, we get past the wars, we're now looking at drugs. Um, and into the you know drug speech, school, you know anti-Vietnam War speech, protests, and then in the 21st century we we start seeing these same-sex marriage um, speech cases. The most recent ones we just saw. These intersections always happen, but here are the fundamental rules to remember: content, viewpoint-based restrictions on speech will basically always fail First Amendment free speech standards. That said, there are limits on free speech in certain categories, and so we looked at these different categories and the regulation of them. We saw the current standard of incitement test where speech can be regulated. We saw the current standard of fighting words speech where fighting words can be regulated. We saw threats in the most recent word from the US Supreme Court, perhaps even making threats um, that are indeed able to be prescribed by the state, but making it narrower as to what is a threat. We saw obscenity and porn and this line of what is protected speech, pornography versus less protected speech, non-protected speech, actually obscenity defamation and the actual malice standard we looked at in terms of that balance that was struck in Sullivan and whether Sullivan will stand. We looked at profanity and then lying, of course, and sort of the protection of the right to lie as being you know, not a category of speech that the First Amendment um, touches unless it hits that defamation fraud type zone. We also then looked at government compelled speech line across those prayer marriage website cases. And I suppose we could end with this thought and idea. One constant in all centuries of free speech law that we've seen is that pornography and incitement speech always plagues the courts. So stay tuned for more Curious Lawyer programs and watch out as we see more pornography cases given the internet and more incitement speeches given our current social political um, dramas enveloping our country. Thank you and as always, if you have any questions, please reach out to me.